Okay, so good morning to USA. Uh, afternoon in Europe, and we have some particip participants from Asia or Australia. I hope I won't be putting you to sleep tonight. <clears throat> anyway, uh, my name is Vladimir Kontur, and today I'll be talking about absorption surface magnetometer for use in uh, Zulf NMR. So uh, I am a PhD student at the Agelonian University Krakow, the Schumann Kustelling Group, and also I am early stage researcher in Zulf NMR ITN. Uh, which is under the Marit kiris Kodolska actions. <clears throat> so for those who are not familiar, Zul NMR is a method complementary to Heifel NMR with the difference that uh, here the sample is pre-polarized outside of the magnetic shield and then it is moved inside of the shield in the guiding field to maintain the polarization. Then we turn off the guiding field and let, let the spins evolve naturally which allows us to observe spin dynamics directly, unlike in a high-field NMR. And the usually most complex, complex part of the Zulf NMR setup is the detection, and uh, that's where the OPMs come, because it is consensus that they provide the best solution, due to various reasons. And it is detection that presents the barrier of entry, because most of the people that are interested in Zulf NMR are non-experts in optical magnetometry, of course and it may be a bit daunting to them. To maybe illustrate the idea why I focus on this uh, kind of magnetometer, uh, on the graph on the right, I tried to show the cost of quality or something in that matter. And looking at the orange line, the cost of measurement time can be shown that, for example, if you would use a, attempt to use a pickup coils in Zulv NMR, you would not be able to measure signals, so you practically would have to measure indefinitely long time. Then maybe if you try to use some envy, uh, envy diamonds, you would possibly measure some signal in some compounds, uh, but you would have to do maybe thousands of averages to get some solid spectra. Then on the other hand, uh, if you would implement some um, state-of-the-art magnetometer, it would probably take you single 10-second measurement to produce a high-quality spectra worthy of article. However, the state-of-the-art magnetometer also has very high cost of implementation and incl that includes the money, the time, and of course the expertise required to optimize such a high-end magnetometer. So I believe the sweet spot is the single beam absorption DC surf magnetometer. And uh, it is because I believe it is sufficient for this use case. And also it is very simple. It's practically one of the simplest magnetometers that can be built. So. Uh, this is kind of the entry point, the Zulf NMR groups, which are the, mostly the chemists and biochemists should be looking at. And I'll be presenting the setup we built at the Agalonian University, and I'll be presenting it in comparison with the uh, Q-spin, which is a commercially available magnetometer. And we had a few talks that already mentioned commercially available magnetometers. And also, I want to compare it because it is often a choice for non-experts to choose a Q-spin and apply it into Zulu NMR setups. So continuing, if people are not familiar with the Q-spin and this fully integrated OPM, which costs around $10,000 and also will most likely require some data acquisition uh, system because it outputs a analog signal, unless you want to be stuck with the digital output, which has pretty limited uh, sampling rate. So keep that in mind for comparison. For the price, it offers very solid field sensitivity below 15 femtotesla per square root hertz. However, it has quite limited bandwidth for our use case, but it's understandable because originally it was designed for uh, magnetoencephalography and cardiography. On the right, we can see a, a very simplified uh, scheme. It, of course, misses some beam conditioning optics, but uh, I think the previous presentation pretty much explain the absorption magnetometer. So uh, we have a source of the uh, laser light, which is resonant with rubidium D1 transition that passes through a uh, three times three times three millimeter microcell in a set of regime and 150 degrees Celsius. And then we have a detection. We will talk more about optics when we look at the setups we actually built. And please keep in mind that the simplicity was actually the goal of building the setup. So for comparison, price is also around 10,000 locking, not included. It includes all the electronics, including the uh, optics you see on the picture. Our current sensitivity is approximately 
80 femtodecla per square rooted, so it's five times worse than the Q spin, but it, or it has been better in past. We had some maintenance to do it, so it's not perfectly optimized, but I believe it can be almost factor of two better. But let's work what we have right now. Also, the bandwidth is almost more than twice wider than what the Q-spin has to offer. So quickly go through the optics. We start with the splitting the beam uh, into a wave meter, which allows us uh, very precisely tune or detune the laser to the D1 resonance. Then we have electronically control how wave plate in front of the linear polarizer. We use that to adjust light intensity that actually passes to the cell inside of the shield. Then we create the circular polarization and pass it through the beam uh, expander. This is in order to have a very homogeneous uh, beam profile. So it helps to achieve a homogeneous pumping inside of the cell and thus we avoid creating the, the grad gradients uh, inside of the cell. And well, then there is plenty of mirrors, of course, and there is the photodiode that creates the feedback for the uh, electrically controlled uh, wave plate at the beginning. Looking at the right, we use a cell which is four times four times two, and it's also in a server regime, I think a bit higher temperature at around 170 degrees. Well, imp very important thing to keep in mind uh, if you want to introduce and compare these two setups is that uh, Q-spin is positioned on the side of the NMR sample. And in our case, the sample is directly about the uh, rubidium cell. Of course, it's, it's not banging directly on the cell. There is a thin Teflon wall, which is not shown on the render. Now, for the uh, like real world uh, performance, we will be using actually a formic acid, which in Zulvan MR, formic acid is practically a benchmark compound, mainly due to the fact it produces very nice pronounced peak and uh, at the given frequency, and also has very high molar capacity, thus produces a very powerful signal. So two groups independently, uh, I'm sorry, two groups independently uh, developed a Zulvan MR systems using Q-spin, and it was the Blanchard group in uh, Mainz, Germany, and my colleague Piotr put at his uh, second one in Berkeley. And both of them using the same size sample of the formic acid achieved uh, 500 SNR with 32 averages. With our setup at the Agalonian University, we were able to get twice that, so 1,000. Now, keep in mind, we have five times worse sensitivity, but also on the other side, it is already outside of the bandwidth of the Q-spin, right? So some of you may already know that this can ac be accounted to one thing, and that is like the geometry, right? So the thing is shown here, the positioning. So I wanted to quantify this, how, how, how large is the actual impact of the difference in geometry? So to do that, I try to normalize uh, some of the properties that are different in our setups. So first thing I did, I calculated single shot SNR from the data on the previous slide, and I did bandwidth adjustment for the Q-spin. So assuming the uh, formic acid spectra would still be within the Q-spin bandwidth, its single shot SNR would be 124. And then I sensitivity adjusted uh, our SNR. So assuming we had the sensitivity of the Q-spin, uh, this would be our SNR. Then I checked for the sample vol volume and rubidium cell volume, and they are practically the same, right? Very close to each other. So now, hypothetically, the only difference between these two uh, setups should be the geometry. Yes, and it would be ideal to do integration over the volume of the sample, over the volume of the uh, cell, but I didn't want to overcomplicate this comparison. So what we have here is the distance between the center of the cell and center of the sample. And in the brackets, you have the shortest distance between the two. So now getting the ratio between the achieved SNR of these two setups, we can see that this geometry factor is 7.6 times better in our setup. And we can conclude that it is inherent advantage of um, using a custom built setup uh, instead of uh, buying a commercial one that you have an option to position your rubidium cell much closer to a, a sample 
right? Because it it has like a very huge impact on your actual SNR. And we can even check if this is correct assumption because we know, we know the dipole-dipole interaction is the, the way we are measuring here. And we know it decays with the uh, one over R cubed. So if you would take this factor and do cube root of this number, we get approximately two, which, which says that on average, each nuclei in our setup is twice closer to the center of the cell than it is in a Q-spin. And roughly looking at the distances we have here from like the technical papers, it, it is approximately right, right? So due to the bandwidth and due to this geometry factor, the Q-spin loses 90% of its potential uh, real life performance. So uh, also due to the fact how the signal averaging works, uh, if we have twice better sensitivity than Q-spin, you have to make four times more measurements with the Q-spin to achieve the same final SNR. And as I said, I'm pretty sure we have, well, almost factor of two headroom of improvement in our system. So this would eventually mean that you would have to measure eight times longer with the Q-spin. And it made, well, uh, comparing, uh, in comparison, the formic acid produces a very strong signal, but uh, in Zulu and MR, often the compounds of interest produce two orders of magnitude lower signals. So we are not doing 32 averages, we are doing hundreds of averages. So actually this geometry factor can make a difference between a few hours of measurement and a few days of measurement. And so that is a thing to keep in mind. Secondly, the bandwidth limitation and or the bandwidth we were able to achieve on our setup, which is more than 350, it allows for proper measurement of the uh, many compounds of interest. Such an example would be all the XA3 systems, of which, for example, I have methanol here. This is just three averages, but you already can see that the SNR is nice. Um, it, I, I think it's very good that we managed to get all spectra within the bandwidth. Because, for example, in, again, in comparison with the Q-spin, the second peak would be outside of the bandwidth and that would be attenuating and most likely would be even smaller than the first peak. Right, so of course you can multiply that part of the spectra by some bandwidth coefficient, but you also multiply the noise and you do not retrieve a better SNR. So again, I believe this is advantage of, you know, making the magnetometer yourself instead of using commercial one. Mm. But, to be honest, I was very interested uh, whether there is a ways how to uh, improve Q-spin for this use case. And I'll be honest, maybe it sounds a bit of like a bashing of Q-spin, but that's absolutely not the case. We like the Q-spin and we actually are working on building the second setup using the Q-spin because it's, let's say, very comfortable option. Okay, so let's see if we can make a Q-spin somehow more useful. There is a paper showing that it can be operated at higher frequencies, but uh, in the RF regime, it's required to use a bias field in the direction of the uh, pumping. Right? And assuming we could use internal coils of Q-spin, those are limited to 50 nanotesla, which means we, can, we could move the resonance maybe to 400 hertz approximately. Right? So that already would be great. However, since the detector is very close to sample, it is almost definite that we would, uh, with, with the field, with the bias field to operate in RF mode, we would affect the NMR sample to a degree that we would not be able to get any useful information from the spectra practically. We would cause the Zeeman splitting on, in our, on our data. So <clears throat> that is probably not possible. There maybe would be possible to do this uh, bell bloom uh, mode in which we would uh, modulate the light intensity. But again, with the custom setup, that is a possibility, but it is not entirely, at least since I know it's not possible to access that option with the Q-spin or any commercial magnetometer for that matter, as far as I know. There is quite few of them and I unfortunately didn't test that many of them. So also I, I was thinking about possibility of trading sensitivity for bandwidth. Right. Usually it's simple to do by changing the cell temperature, by lowering the cell temperature and thus adjusting your relaxation rate. 
Again, I'm not sure if that option is uh, possible in QSpin. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's not unless you hack it somehow, right? I'm not sure about other uh, optical magnetometers, but uh, commercial magnetometers, but as far as I know, they usually are, you know, they can pre-optimize, right? So they don't really let you play with, you know, these operational parameters. That's pretty much what you are paying for, one of the things. The expertise that was put into optimizing them. Uh, so also, I think it will be possible to do a change in external, external modulation with the Q-spin, thus increasing the modulation field and modulation frequency, thus keeping the modulation index the same, but hopefully causing the uh, larger field to broaden the resonance, thus broaden the bandwidth. But, I mean, do we really want to lower sensitivity further? Because, you know, it's a trade-off. And it may or may not be worth it depending on the very specific situation and the compound you want to measure. So to summarize, till now I was mainly like showing the benefits of building the custom setup, right? We, you won't save much on the money in either of the options. If you are building a mobile setup, a Q-spin can really bring an advantage here. Then when it comes to measuring time, it is definitely worth building your custom setup. And of course, the bandwidth and all, all around the customization and flexibility that is provided with the setup you built and you know, you can play around with all the parameters, but on the other hand, it's not just the advantage, it's the, the biggest amount of work, right? Optimizing and building. So now let's talk more about the minuses of the custom setup, right? The Q-spin comes out of the box working, a few days and it's implemented, maybe even less. Right, you have a warranty and you have a support from the experts and all these things included. But if you want to build your own, you have to design and manufacture a lot of parts. You have to manufacture your heating and heating is sensitive thing because if your heating fails and your rubidium cells cool suddenly, there is a chance it will degrade, right? And you know, the rubidium cells, they don't grow on a tree. So there is a chance of screwing up, honestly. Uh, Again, all the maintenance, all the fixings you are doing yourself and also you do optimization yourself. And this is just one old picture I found. It shows the way I was doing the optimization. So it's called scanning optimization or the grid optimization. And on the picture you can see on the X axis, I'm scanning the, the frequency and on the Y I'm changing the intensity of the light and I'm measuring the actual SNR. So you can see that when I'm totally at the resonance, in the middle that the, there is nothing. I'm not getting any signal practically, right? And then I was looking for some global maxima and I was doing this for each operational parameter, right? And I was doing it automatically. So, you know, it added a lot of work to make it work as it is right now. So there is a lot of uh, work behind building it. It's simple setup, but I'm not saying it's easy. But as things are now, I am convinced that it is still worth building your custom setup, even if you are non-expert in optical magnetometry. If you can get a, into contact or support from somebody who already built, I think it's still very well worth it. This may, this may as well change because I can see that there are commercial magnetometers being developed all the time, right? So when the ones with the Zulven MR in mind come to a market, this may change and it may be much more worth it to just buy commercial and ready, uh, ready to use. So I think those are both good options, but you know that I'm siding with building a new one. I also think it's a great opportunity to maybe, you know, uh, deepen the cooperation between uh, optical magnetometry experts and the experts from the other fields. So why not use it? Anyway, I would like to thank all supports either it is institutional or the support from other members of my team. Thank you very much and also thank you very much for your attention. Cool, thanks for the nice talk, Vladimir. Uh, nice nice uh, surf magnetometer you built there and of course we are all big fans of Q-spins. Um, we have a few questions also uh, from actually the main author of the paper you cited regarding the bandwidth of the Q-spin. Uh, Igor Zavukov is making a comment here. Um, where, what is he saying? Q span magnetometer loses sensitivity for 200 hertz signal. However, self magnetometers can be tuned with the bias field and then sensitivity can be improved substantially. 
We are able to tune Q-spin magnetometers to two kilohertz. Thank you for your slide. There's another, uh, I guess, um, I'm not sure who this question is addressed to, but uh, I guess to you by Michael Taylor. Um, I presume one could modify the Q-spin package into a low, closer sample approach at the expense of other possibly unimportant factors, thermal insulation. Have you or anyone else tried that? Uh, and I think actually we in Minds have tried that in, uh, well, for, I mean, what, I mean, I think we removed the, um, the plastic covering and got a bit closer. I mean, uh, but yeah. I, I'm not sure whether we have conclusive results on this. Definitely, we got closer without co compromising the uh, the sensitivity too much. Did you try this too, uh, Vladimir? I'm sorry. Did you also try to modify the packaging of the Q spin? No, 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 not not it. Uh, our, Q, our Q spin is actually staggered custom, so I don't have a really hands-on experience with the Q spin, but most of my colleagues do. So I, I'm looking forward to to run a lot of tests and all of the possibilities that can be done with the Q spin. Good and. Uh, uh, there's a um, comment from the Leibniz IPHT, but I think it's mostly uh, a comment whether you've included your working time in the cost of the DIY setup. No, that, then it will be much more expensive, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, uh, I gained a lot of experience working on it and it was enjoyable. Right? So that's what I can say. I enjoyed it. Well, all right. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.